Good evening, sir. Well, I know you. Why? We met at Miss Poolman's the other day. So you come to slum it in Whitechapel, eh? Do you know Dr. Tumblety? A Canadian or American chap. Quite an extravagant dresser. Frequents this pub now and then. Are you... intimate? Um, no. What do you mean by that? Oh, nothing. Nothing at all. I just wanted to prove my discretion concerning this man. In so much and so far as I know him. You wouldn't like it if one day the tables were turned and everyone was talking about why you were in the borough. Isn't that so? As it happens, I saw Miss Pullman recently. She told me that she couldn't wait to see you again. She said something about a surprise that is waiting for you at her establishment. Why, that is some of the best news I've heard, my friend. As thanks, I would like to let you in on a secret. The man that you were talking about, and whom I happen to know by sight, passed by and went through that little door that you see over there. Another man let him in. They weren't together for more than a few minutes, to be sure, eh? Well, I will continue my search. Ah, uh, love. But what is this person trying to imply? This matter is beyond me. Hey, you can't go in there. It's private. Got it? Greetings, my good man. Could I have a pint? Here, Gov. I've been told that Dr. Tumblety might be found around here. Is that so? I don't do a roll call of all the drunkards here. I've got my hands full just making sure I get their money. Don't people pay when they order? Nah, look at that little scribbler there. Completely dead drunk. Tonight's tally is about as long as his arm. If he skips out, I'll be in for a guinea almost. What's behind that locked door over there? Can I go in? Not likely. And let me be unless you're wanting a drink, got it? What's behind that log? Goodbye, my friend. Oi, that's it. Good evening, sir. It'll be the cool of my career, Governor said. Ha! <laughs> You'll make loads of dust of the paper, he said. You're a journalist? That's so. Tom Bulling at your service. <laughs> the Whitechapel ferret. The wizard with the scoop. You don't appear to be in a state to write anything, my friend. You're mistaken. Whiskey passes through the blood and turns into ink. Simple. <laughs> you see, mugs and inkwells are all the same. Don't you think you should settle your tab and go home? My red ink? Where's my red ink? I won't even pay half a halfpenny if they don't return my red ink. It's my blood you hear. Very well. I'll be on my way. This is the sink where the barmaid puts the glasses to soak. Look, red ink. What's that doing here? The bottle is closed. There must still be some ink inside, and it looks like a glass. The barmaid must have put ink into the sink by mistake. Right. Do I get in your way? Me? If you'll excuse me, sir. You're the best, the boss told me. My red ink. Well, where she be? I found your red ink, my friend. You should settle up and head home. Thank you, my friend, thank you. The spring-heeled phantom will be revived. Gov? Here you go. It's on the journalist, my friend. I owe you one. The next one is on me. What'll it be? Nothing, thanks. But I may need your help. Listen, my friend. I would like you to let me in the door over there. You're a bobby. A peeler? Absolutely not, my friend. I am a doctor. Fine. I owe you this at least. There's a bloke behind that door there. No pity Bluto. 
let's just say he wants to lay low for a moment. So I don't think he'll be opening the door just now. Unless... Tell him you have word from Squibby. That'll open the door. But who can say what'll happen when the door closes? Goodbye, my friend. Oi! That's it! Let me in. I... I have news from Squibby. But stay calm. And who are you? Where's Squibby? He's out. To be honest, I don't actually know this Squibby chap. I was actually wondering if you knew Dr. Tumblety. A Canadian or American fellow. He came in... Sure we know him. Excellent. Can you... You know about gas? I'm afraid not. I am a doctor. Then I ain't interested. You can be leaving now. But if I find out who snitched to the peelers, I'll find you. Got it? But I can pay you for... Keep your coins for the paupers. Or one of the gas boys who ain't afraid of nothing and knows how to hold his tongue. You bring him to me. I'll meet with you. Well, it would seem that I have all the information I need for my investigation. Anyway, this fellow Bluto at the Wasp's Nest is rather shady and doesn't look like he'll want to cooperate. I'd be better off returning to Baker Street. Holmes will certainly know what to do. And besides, I am worn out. Let's go back to Baker Street. Home sweet home. There we are, Holmes. I've told you in great detail everything that happened last night. Excellent work, Watson. We shall now be prepared to answer a few questions about the horrible murder in Hanbury Street. Do you think we are now in a position to find out the identity of the murderer of these two women? No, I don't think so. It's outside of our scope and not our responsibility. As much as you've done for Leather Apron and the affair with the pills, our mission is to help the police by ensuring that they don't get caught up following false leads and to point them in the right direction. Let us start from what we know with some certitude. As you have just said, it is almost certain that the same person killed the Bucks Row and Hanbury Street victims. The reason to assume as much are numerous and I shan't elaborate here. What do these two victims have in common? It's true these two women were in the same profession, but... Indeed, Watson. These two women were both prostitutes. That is of vital importance, Watson. My memory from your examination of the scene is rather hazy. Didn't you say something about the killer's frame of mind? I was talking about the victim's possessions that were placed on the ground and the rings missing from Annie Chapman's fingers. This killer is a cunning predator, comes from a rather humble background and shows steely self-control in carrying out the murders. Something is puzzling me, Holmes. Richardson's testimony contradicts the time of death given by Dr. Phillips which also matches my own, 4.30 a.m. And yes, we shall confirm that, Watson, and attempt to determine the precise time of death. In order to do that, we will need to place everyone involved on a timeline. Only after that will we be able to place the knife symbolizing our killer. Let's look at our timeline, Watson. Let's put the time of death as assessed by Dr. Phillips on the timeline. The assessment of the time of the murder given by Dr. Phillips and yourself, Watson, 4.30 a.m. We left the station at 6 o'clock and it took us 20 minutes to arrive at Hanbury Street. Our arrival at the scene occurred at around 6.20. Given the distance separating the two locations, we can deduce that the corpse wasn't discovered after 6 o'clock and therefore that the murder must have been committed before.
Now, for the most important part, the testimony of Miss Long. She claims to have seen a woman speaking to a man near 29 Hanbury Street sometime around... What time, Watson? Let us assume, therefore, that Miss Long's testimony is, as is most certainly the case, true. She places her meeting with the victim at around 5.30, claiming to have heard a clock chime on the half hour at the moment when she enters the street. Now, let's put the Richardson's arrival and departure times on the timeline. Now, let's put the Richardson's arrival and departure. Despite the great respect I have for Dr. Phillips and the value I place on our friendship, my deepest conviction is that both of you are mistaken and that Richardson is in the right and that these two testimonies put down in writing have real worth. But how? Explain yourself, Holmes. Remember how you assessed the time of death? You touched the fingers and body of the victim, but it was remarkably cold for this time of year. In addition, the corpse had been drained of bodily fluids. Its heat retention was therefore no longer the same as that of an intact corpse. Egad! You're right, Holmes. Oh, I've had some time to research, Watson. Given these facts, my first diagnosis may have been off by half an hour, perhaps even an hour. Thus, we can confirm Richardson's statement and establish that the murder was committed after 4.50am and not before 4.30am. Our next witness is Albert Kadosh. Albert Kadosh goes down into his garden at approximately 5.20 and on re-entering his home, hears voices in number 29's garden. Let's place this symbol that represents Kadosh on the timeline. Kadosh goes back down into his garden approximately four minutes after having left it and hears the sound of an impact against the wooden fence. Let's place this symbol that represents... Kadosh leaves the garden, enters his house, then leaves for work, seeing the clock on the Spitalfields Church showing 5.32. Excellent, Watson. All our people are now in place. Yes, but Holmes, Miss Long, claims to have seen the victim at around 5.30. But according to Kadosh, someone, most certainly the victim and her murderer, was already in the garden at 5.30. Excellent observation, Watson. It must be noted, however, that these two witnesses, Long and Kadosh, saw the time shown on the clocks in the area, which are often inaccurate and went by their empirical and, in this case, erroneous estimate of how much time had passed. Thus, neither of these two times can be considered reliable. Do you mean to say that these two testimonies might match? Indeed. Let's put Miss Long's meeting with the victim at two minutes before 5.30. Let's add Miss Long's meeting with the victim at two minutes before 5.30 a.m. Mr. Kadosh claims to have passed by the Spitalfields Church at 5.32, which, given the distance from 27 Hanbury Street, would mean he was still at home at 5.31. Let's therefore put the end of his testimony at 5.31. Miss Long heard the man say to the victim, Will you do it? To which the victim responded, Yes, which would suggest that an agreement was reached and that the transaction was imminent. They then proceeded to enter the garden, which puts the voices heard by Kadosh at 5.29. We had thought that Kadosh had left 27 Hanbury Street at 5.31 after having heard an impact against the fence. 
Thus, two minutes passed between the moment when Kadosh entered the house after having been in the garden the first time and the moment when he returns to go out again and leave for work. How long did he estimate this interval to be? Three to four minutes. In light of all this, Watson, we can finally establish the time of Chapman's murder. Now, place the knife at the exact time. Now then, taking into account that the local clock isn't exact and that a young man was off by a minute or two in his estimations of his comings and goings, we can confirm Miss Long's testimony and place the time of the crime at approximately 5.30. But in that case, Holmes, the man that Miss Long saw is none other than... That's right, Watson. It was the Whitechapel killer. To think that Miss Long and Kadosh were only a few feet away from him. Indeed, Watson. Had Miss Long passed just a little closer to the victim and her assassin, or had the young Kadosh popped his head over the fence out of curiosity, the killer would most certainly already be behind bars. That's some stroke of luck he had there. I couldn't agree more, Watson. But his luck didn't end there, given the mutilations inflicted upon this poor woman. What must be considered, above all, is the killer's obvious wish to remove one and only one specific organ. His surgery pinpointed the exact spot, avoiding superfluous incisions. This suggests the man possesses at least a minimal anatomical knowledge. Are you suggesting a, a doctor or a butcher? Perhaps, but the possibilities are still too broad to conclude with any certainty. Now for the motive. Despite my almost complete lack of practical experience on the subject, I have a rather precise idea of the usefulness of a uterus and a vagina. Nonetheless, once they are separated from their usual envelope, I am more circumspect as to the uses one can make of them. What do you think, Watson? We need a board, Watson. 